Hey everyone, this is Rock from StageInTheSky.com and today I'm going to hit on the notion of self-love, right? Is self-love really so bad? Because I've been hearing good things about it, I've been hearing bad things about it, and then also, you know, I think today our modern culture, we have a tendency to latch on to these very positive sounding affirmations that I think belie a very destructive behavior. Alright, so let's begin with this quote. To love someone, you must first love yourself. Because if you don't love yourself, how could you ever love someone else? Right? How many times have we heard this? Now, it sounds like a profound, proper question to ask. In fact, the notion of loving yourself sounds all good and, you know, it sounds healthy. And yet, through mere observation over the years, it's not something you just roll out of bed and, you know, you pick up on it right away. But it takes time to really observe what's going on and you start to notice that something is a bit off with this whole self-love crowd. The first time I heard about the notion of loving yourself was back when I was 23. This is back in January 2010. Back then I was um, part of an acting class that I got roped into and I noticed that this is downtown Clearwater, Florida. Um, this is the hub of Scientology. And one of the guys in the acting class was a singer in his mid thirties. And I remember one night I was on a treadmill like downtown Clearwater and he spotted me while he was driving by the gym. And he came in, he, he just talked to me. I ended my workout and we just talked for like hours right there in the middle. I mean, you guys have seen this, right? Where you're in the gym and all of a sudden you just like a barbershop style conversation just takes place. And right then it was like 10 o'clock at night. So it was just me and him. And we just started talking about philosophy and love and life. I was 23 and this guy, in, I remember his name, his name was Jesse Leros. Uh, and Jesse Leros, you can tell by looking at this guy, I mean, he, he looks charismatic. He looks like your alpha male. He looks like he knows his way around women. Um, you know, just a little bit of background information about him. He was signed by Sony back then. I'm not sure if he's still with them. Um, he went on to star in NCIS New Orleans. And, you know, it, I was just blessed because I was, like, if you looked at me back then, and I have this blurry picture from 2010, I, you know, there was nothing really shining or positive about my image that said this guy's gonna grow up to be something great but he just took the time to just school me you know he turned on my critical thinking skills and you know he taught me i remember we were in the gym he taught me rock you know there's two ways just because there's two ways presented to you it doesn't mean that you can't create a third way you know like those kind of philosophies and it was him who told me in order to love someone you must first love yourself and he said this because back then i was about 312 pounds still at the time um, I had a crush on one of the girls in our acting class and I confided in him about my lack of confidence. I mean, I mean, it makes sense. When you're really, really fat, you don't have a lot of confidence. And this girl that I had a crush on, she was gorgeous. But still, he insisted that the key was for me to focus on myself, to love myself, be more confident in myself, to have greater respect for myself. And I'm like, wow, thanks, Jesse. <laughs> <laughs> and even before talking to Jesse, there were other Scientologists in the class. They were imparting a similar philosophy. It was an emphasis on self. That was one of the main talking points. And it was a very enticing concept, you know, that what, what was true for you is true for you. That's what I kept hearing. And that's tantamount to just self-acceptance. And it's a shortened quote from the founder, L. Ron Hubbard, who said, What is true for you is what you have observed yourself. And when you lose that, you have lost everything. Right? Sounds awesome. Wow. Yeah. The philosophy back then for me when I was 23, it was enticing because I suspected it to be enticing for a lot of young people because we struggled with our self-identity, you know, unless, of course, you born and raised in a single culture your whole life where you just fit in. So you never even have to think about it. But for me, my background, I was military raised, you know, so I moved around a lot. I was ingrained with multiple cultures. I didn't have just one. So I didn't really have an identity of my own or an identity where there were other people like me. You know, so I struggled with it. So the philosophy was enticing. And even today, we keep hearing this notion of my truth as opposed to the truth, you know, and it's usually from females, I hate to say, you know, and I think that the notion of, you know, embracing your truth, my truth, as opposed to the truth, it feeds into the notion that reality is whatever you believe it is, regardless of what it really is. And it's enticing to us, especially as young people, because it allows us to live in a dream world of sorts, almost like a Peter Pan complex where you never really have to grow up. And instead, you can spend your entire life or a great majority of it holding on to a dream or a philosophy that may prevent you from actually moving forward. That's why very often a lot of people keep making the same mistakes. They keep going for the same guys or the same girls, and they never really move forward because it's my truth. This is my world, right? Of course, I could be wrong about all this. I'm just spitballing. But anyway, let's move forward. Flash forward years later, and it seems we've entered the age of movements and ideology sprung forth from random individuals by way of social medias. 
And I'd argue that once upon a time, such movements and ideologies were debated in universities and public forums and then published on a massive scale after having been scrutinized and picked apart by accredited philosophers and renowned thinkers. Now, you don't need any of that. All you need to do is just be popular. That's why, you know, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, all you need to do is just have a large following, push this notion of, you know, like, what's her name? Amber Rose talked about, oh, no slut shaming. And because she's popular and she basically brought out every woman that was like her way, way back where, you know, shaming was something that we really, we really needed. You know, shame was something telling you, hey, what I'm doing is wrong. This doesn't feel right. That's shame. You know, but with Amber Rose telling you, oh, it's okay, you can keep doing that. Oh, well, if Amber Rose says it and she's popular, I can do it too, which just enabled a bunch of whores, essentially. Which brings me to the notion of self love. <laughs> this brings me to the notion of self love. Now, I may have heard of it back in 2010 when I was talking to Jesse Leros back when I was 23, but I really didn't notice its prevalence. Like, it's being so widespread and promoted on such a on a wide scale, you know, um, until I started using Instagram back in 2018. You know, I'm always late to the party. I wasn't Instagram way back when it first came out, but when it first came out, I just saw people posting pictures of food. So I'm like, okay, I don't want anything to do with this. And in 2018, I got on it again. I'm like, oh, beautiful ladies. Yep, part of it now. You know, and some of the most beautiful men in the world, you know, with nearly half a million to millions of followers, they kept promoting that hashtag, self-love, hashtag self-love. You know, their motivational quotes and messages were always boasting of self-love and loving yourself, treating yourself well, you know? This girl in particular, her name is Savannah Seavers, <laughs> I'm butcher her last name. Um, but back in 2018, first off, she's one of the most beautiful women I've ever seen, just hands down. Like, I, when I see her, I am inspired to work out, to stay in shape, to make something of myself because she is gorgeous. Just putting it out there. But back in 2018, when I first found her, she had about, I was one of 250K followers, right? And believe it or not, sometimes we chat through her stories because she travels a lot. And I used to work the night shift back then. So I was probably one of the few followers awake. So, you know, she'll post from the airport and I would just joke and chat with her. And I think she appreciated that. Um, but the thing is, Savannah, she was always pushing this notion of self-love, loving yourself. And at first I was on board with the positivity of it, you know, I, I thought it was a good thing. I thought it was a great way to improve your self-esteem and your mental health. Better to love yourself than hate yourself, right? And very often people, you know, they allow themselves to be taken advantage of to such a destructive extent, you know, that they do need to be told, hey, you need to love yourself more, you know? You, you got something in you, you gotta respect yourself. As one of my friends put it just recently, he's like, there's a sweet spot for self-love where you don't want to go too far one way or the other. He'd, he used uh, the Tiger Woods golf game, you know, when you're swinging, you want it, you know, right there, that sweet spot. After a while, however, after seeing a lot of Savannah's posts and the kind of activities she was indulging in, I started to wonder though, is self-love really about self-acceptance and mental health awareness? And more and more, her post started to boast about, you know, luxury and extravagance and opulence. She started posting from people from places all around the world, you know, all these expensive events, once in a lifetime activities that most could only dream of experiencing. All power to her, I'm not jealous or anything like that. But she's posting all this stuff with the, the notion of love yourself. She kept pushing that love yourself you should truly take care of yourself you should love yourself now here's the issues with self-love even before i really dug deep this is just something that just came to mind and after you're following savannah i finally posted this on one of her posts because she kept pushing self-love this is what i said self-love certainly does sound nice but i'd be weary of embracing any notion of self-love too much i'm thinking love is more about what you can give others than what others can give you or what you can give yourself. Taking care of yourself and making sure you're working yourself are just normal adult things people should be doing. Instead, from what I'm seeing from the self-love crowd is a prioritizing of self above all else, and that is deplorable. She responded in kind, sticking to her guns, talking about, oh, well, self-love is really needed and all that. And I didn't take it any further than that. You know, what I said, it might've sound judgmental, but I don't think I'm alone pointing it out. But Rock, why did you feel the need to say anything? If you don't like what she had to say, you could have just ignored it. As I mentioned, I have been ignoring them for over a year, well over six months at least. And Savannah's cool. I knew she wouldn't mind this kind of discussion because I think a lot of ladies, especially the, these gorgeous 10 out of 10 ladies, they, they sometimes get tired of just dealing with yes men who blindly agree with everything they're saying just to stay in her good grades. So sometimes they like being challenged just a little bit. Honestly, if it if I believed that it'd be a waste of time to say anything to her, I wouldn't have bothered, which is why I don't deal with Black Lives Matter chicks. 
I also did a quick Google search, and there's like dozens of writers and armchair philosophers saying the same thing that I'm about to say. I'm merely addressing it now because someone called me out on it in one of Kevin Samuel's last YouTube videos. He did, it's called The Self-Love of Modern Women. And one female commenter said this, this is a good comment, she said, I think self-love is supposed to be about loving yourself the way you love someone close to you, like a family member. You take care of yourself, exercise, eat right, hold yourself accountable, and not abuse yourself when you mess up, but accept it, learn from it, and keep trying. Self-love shouldn't get in the way of building a relationship with someone. It's just about having some self-respect for your health and yourself. I think what the commenter said was spot on in a lot of ways. Truly, well done. Kudos to that person. However, it's kind of like when you ask someone what feminism is, and you'll always get someone who says, well, it's about equality for all, but really it's more than that, isn't it? Even if that's what you believe about feminism, can you honestly say that's how most people are using it in the public sphere? On a surface, a lot of people use these phrases like body positivity and no shaming that sound nice and reasonable, but by mere observation, you begin to notice that it's not really what they say it is. Not to mention, there may be some counterproductive results to these movements and these phrases that they use. With self-love, what I'm seeing from those who chant it proudly is truly an emphasis on self-pleasure, as in your happiness, your fun, doing what makes you feel good should trump everything else, putting yourself first, prioritizing yourself, essentially self-centered make yourself the center of the universe okay so what's the problem it's your life you should do whatever makes you happy i disagree i disagree wholeheartedly and once upon a time i i used to believe as what you just said you know like it's my life i can do whatever i want with it however i believe there are a lot of things that make might make us happy here and now but it'll come back to bite us in the long run things like sex drugs partying too much eating too much drinking too much and what if what makes you happy makes God unhappy. As Christians, we must choose. But of course, I think that's why a lot of people don't read the Bible. Because if you don't know premarital sex is bad in God's eyes, you can claim ignorance and blissfully keep on doing it because it makes you happy, as if God can't see right through this. Also, can you imagine what society would be like if everyone thought about prioritizing self, putting themselves first? But we have won World War II if our men didn't storm the beaches in Normandy because they prioritized themselves over the greater good? Don't even get me started on the Civil War. I mean, just recently, flipping O'Shea Jackson, he posted on his community, he said, hey, what are white people afraid of? And yeah, comment after comment after comment of black people saying, oh, yeah, white people, they're afraid of the black community gaining wealth. They're, they're afraid of a strong black man. They're, I'm like, dude, the Civil War was fought by white men who didn't even know you. Like, we, I mean, they sacrificed some lives, their lives for you. Once upon a time, we valued things like honor and valor. Now, that, not so much. And what about pedophiles, okay? What about pedophiles and serial killers and rapists? You could very well argue that some of the worst criminals and despots, all these dictators, they had a mentality that was full of self-love. Think about the different arguments you hear from progressive. They ask questions like, so what, am I supposed to deny myself? Is it fair that other people can live normal lives but I can't because I'm a little different? It's a slippery slope, right? If we tolerate and accept a certain lifestyle because it makes that person happy, you can apply the same logic to other people who want to engage in immoral bad behavior. I'll never forget this frustrating debate that my boss had with a guy who was all for gay marriage. He used the reasoning of, what two people do in the comfort of their own home is nobody's business. Why do you want to stand in the way of love? Why do others want to stand in the way of their love? However, when asked, if he, if the same guy, when he was asked, okay, would you be okay if a man had multiple wives, basically polygamy? And he said, the same guy who was for gay marriage and used the, the logic of, oh, well, it's nobody's business. He said, no, that's not right. One wife is good enough. You shouldn't be taking on multiple spouses, whether you're a man or a woman. Made absolutely no sense. It's like their logic, they, they didn't even realize, hey, same logic. But you're, you as an individual, you're picking and choosing which behavior you choose to accept, which is bullshit. And this is why our country is divided. Okay. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1-5, through 5, God warned us, but understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty, for people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient of the parents, ungrateful, and unholy, and it goes on. In verse 5, God tells us, avoid such people. God actively tells us to avoid these kind of people. Can you imagine why? Kidding, that's not hard to see. I have the image of Gaston here. Even with online dating, when I'm meeting these ladies, it seems to escape a lot of them that good men, not bad boys who want strippers and whores, but good men, when it comes to selecting a beautiful potential wife, we're not just thinking about ourselves, we're thinking about our future children. Not ourselves, our future children, our family. 
Just recently, I went to a graduation where one of my aunts asked, Rock, why are you still single? This happens a lot. I don't get mad at it. You know, it makes sense to question it. I mean, I, I think I'm a good looking guy. So it makes sense. I'm like, well, what? How are you not? How did someone not scoop you up? Get that all the time. Now, it's difficult for me to explain that to people without sounding like everyone else is a problem, right? I'm 35. I don't want to be that guy. I'm like, well, this is where we live in. People, they're, they're crazy. <laughs> I don't want to be that guy. But the truth is, I really do live by Bible principles. Verse 5 tells us to avoid such people. And because I follow the scriptures, because I avoid such people, it makes me judgmental by today's standards, which is why I'm going to just straight up tell people, Rock, why are you, so, why are you still single? I'm going to say, because I'm judgmental. That's the truth. And not to mention, inevitably, you're going to come to that conclusion. Just as a lot of women are looking for men to be good, stable providers, men are looking for wives who will be good mothers to our children. Can you indulge in self-love while self-sacrificing at the same time? Maybe. I'm not sure. But what about men? I'm always hearing from your precious manosphere that men are told to focus on themselves. Well, that's, and that, that's what male content creators are telling their followers. True. But if I'm not mistaken, it's usually in the context of chasing women. They're telling men to stop chasing women and to focus on your career and building yourselves up first. I'm not sure that's self-love we're talking about here. How? That's all self-love is. It's all about taking care of yourself and loving yourself and putting yourself first. Right, so there are guys who, who go their own way. There's the MGTOW crew, men going their own way, in which they've sworn off dating and pursuing romantic relationships with women. Now, you might have a case there, but even there, a lot of the MGTOW guys I've seen, they don't live in the pursuit of self-pleasure, but they actually seek fulfillment, which comes from working, building, and helping others. Others. Most of the guys and red pill content creators that I follow, they're telling men to build themselves up and focus on themselves, usually for a purpose and goal. And one of those purposes, one of the biggest goals that we have for building ourselves up is for our own family, i.e. others. <laughs> We're told to build ourselves up so we can buy it for our families, which include, guess what, women. Even in my 20s, one of the main reasons why I bust my ass, sacrifice my weekends, vacations, and times off trying to get published was to build a financial foundation by which I could get out of debt and start my future family. It wasn't just for me, self. It wasn't just for myself. Now ask yourself, of this modern crew, of these ladies, these Instagram models who tout self-love, how many of them are focusing on themselves and putting themselves first to benefit others? No, I'm not saying that women are more selfish than men. There's plenty of selfish men out there. I had to put this disclaimer out there because you, you know how people are. Oh, what about them? I get it. But Rock, you can't expect others to love you if you don't love yourself first. I don't believe that's necessarily true. Loving yourself certainly helps when it comes to projecting a positive vibe and upbeat nature, but let's be honest. When a man or woman finds themselves attracted to you or someone, they aren't thinking to themselves, yeah, I really like him because you can tell they really love themselves. Some people say that, I have heard it, but most people aren't thinking that. There's usually something else. In a lot of cases, people, you know, they fall in love because misery loves company, as in, I'm looking for someone who's just as messed up as I am. Anyone who's too happy, upbeat, or optimistic won't do for this lot. That's why you get drug addicts and, you know, rockers who, you know, they flock together and they fall in love. You can, I mean, you can't tell me Kirk Cobain loved himself when he shot himself. Or Sid and Nancy, you know, these are just two examples that come to mind. My point being, the focus and emphasis on loving yourself first, I don't think is the pinnacle prerequisite needed for another person to love you. Not to mention, what if you do spend all this time coming to love yourself first, and other people, they simply don't love who you are, or rather they don't love who you've chosen to be. That's just one more reason why we appreciated Kevin Samuels, because the frustration and confusion of today's dating culture, it comes from society telling men what we should be attracted to instead of telling women what we really are attracted to, mainly her youth, beauty, and fertility. And I'll go ahead and add her chastity, because women these days are racking up a large body count. And dude, I mean, I know some men are, you know, they like a woman who's loose and, oh yeah, she's free, you know, she give it up. I know some guys are like that and they're into the hookup culture, but not good men. We're talking about good men here. We're talking about godly men. All right. And when people say, oh, where are all the good men at? They're godly men. All right. A man who wants you to, you know, give up sex on the first date. That's not a good man. And you should know this by now. Any woman who, I mean, I say that, man, but a lot of people aren't raised right. So I, 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 I apologize. I don't know what you should know by now. If you're just not hearing it for the first time, please. Take my word for it. Read the Bible. Read the scriptures. I'm telling you the truth. Good men wait until marriage because that's what the Bible tells us and good men do what's good in God's eyes. All right, Rock, but say you do find this perfect woman that you seem to think exists somewhere. How is she going to be able to love you or anyone else if she doesn't know how to love herself first? Huh? 
That question was asked to me recently, and it prompted this here essay. Because I know it sounds like a profound question, but truth is we've been doing it naturally and involuntarily for generations. Think of parents, think of firefighters, doctors, volunteers, pet owners, nurses, the heroes of 9-11, the, the veterans of Normandy Beach who stormed Iwo Jima, etc, etc. Consider John 15 verse 13, it says, Greater love has no, no other than this, that someone laid down his life for his friends. This cannot be understated. Ladies and gentlemen, this cannot be understated. Essentially, Jesus Christ was saying that sacrificial love is the greatest form of love of all. This is what we should be striving for, more than love for ourselves. But of course, this is easier said than done, right? I mean, I know I give up my life for my brothers or my niece, but for a friend? I mean, and also, you know, if you wouldn't give up your life for someone, does that mean that you really don't love the person? I'm not sure. But check this out. 1 John chapter 4, verse 7 through 19, we find a beautiful expression of God's love and what it means to love in general. But succinctly put at verse 19, the scripture says, brace yourself, we love because he first loved us. Think about it, love, self-love, agape, Forget all these definitions, forget all the quotes, the poems, the expressions, the cliches, but think about how we really know what love is. The famous scripture at John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. So, here's something to consider. It's just, just food for thought. Perhaps instead of asking how can you love someone if you don't know how to love yourself first, a better question would be how can you love someone if you don't know what it's like to be loved? Let me say it one more time. How can you love someone if you don't know what it's like to be loved? How many times have we heard of ladies falling for the bad guys? And nine times out of 10, it's based on not having loving examples in the household to show them. Or basically, the examples they do have were just bad examples. For a lot of people, all they have to go on when it comes to love is what they see on TV and in movies. And where we have love and hip hop, man, because a lot of people, they idealize this notion of, oh, well, this is love because there's drama and there's excitement here, you know? Like, this is how you know that you're in a good relationship. That's all they got to go on is what VH1 and the Bravo shows are telling them, you know? So when you do come up to a boring, stable, mature guy, you think, oh, he didn't love me, this is boring, this is bad for me. Stupid! <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. It, that is just dumb, all right? They, a lot of people, they think that the open expressions of jealousy, the sex, the impulsiveness, and a man risking it all, these are viable, acceptable, and wanted expressions of true love. This is not good. This is not good for the culture. It's not good for you. It's not good for your future children. All right? Half the men, I would say, who are locked up in prison did dumb things for their women. You know, they... In, don't get me started. Okay, let's move on. All right, so if you've never been loved, how would you know what love is? Sure, you could guess, but I suspect a lot of people confuse how a person makes you feel with love when really it's just the chemical releases in your body that you're addicted to when you're around that person, all right? Is that love? Is it part of it? How would you recognize it? How would you appreciate it? From what I've seen, and it's mostly the younger crowd here, 28 and younger, they're the ones who are really promoting and pushing the self-love culture. I bring up their youth because, just gonna be honest here, the inexperience coupled with self-indulgence, it leads to the illogical conclusion that if it doesn't make you happy, then it must be bad for you, and vice versa. If it makes you happy, then it must be good for you. This is stupid and dangerous. I keep using stupid because there's no other word for it. I'm sorry if it sounds insulting, but it just, it's not good, okay? When I was in my early 20s, back before Jesse Lyra's talked to me, I don't think I understood what love, what it meant to be loved, okay? So I'm not above all these people. It's not like I just roll out of bed and be like, yeah, I have all this logic. But back then, I was in the same boat. I didn't know what it meant to be loved. My parents divorced when I was six, and when my mom remarried, my brothers, we couldn't tell you. You know, like, I don't think I ever have a single image in my mind of my mom and my stepdad kissing or, you know, they might have hugged once or twice, but usually there was no public displays of affection. So I didn't know what it meant to be loved in that sense, you know, and even when it comes to my parents, you know, food, shelter, water, that was basically it. That was all our parents showed us about love. Love is taking care of making sure you're taken care of. That's all that, that's all I, that we were given. The love that you think of when it comes to friends though, and your girlfriend or a spouse, as I said, all I knew is what I saw on TVs and movies, and you know, because my parents kept parental locks on all the channels because they were religiously strict, the examples I got were very unrealistic examples like Saved by the Bell and Family Matters and Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. The world's not like that, and because I never experienced like anything like I saw on TV, I honestly believe that I was never loved. 
and sad <laughs> sad thing to say i don't think i'm alone here i think a lot of guys are experienced or they know what i'm going through or they know what it's like to go through what i went through but i never had a girlfriend tell me that she loved me until i was 30 years old this doesn't mean that people never loved me okay I, I was just too young and i was too inexperienced to recognize it for what it was and none of this had anything to do let me let me pause for a second there let me hit that one more time I was too young and I was too inexperienced to recognize love for what it was. Just to give you an example, when I was like 20, 21, I had plenty of, I didn't have official girlfriends. You know, that was kind of the story of my life. I had females who I was in a relationship with and we flirted, you know, but we never took it to the level of boyfriend and girlfriend. I had a lot of those in my life. Sad to say, you know, because man, there's always just one thing that would prevent me from going out with them. Either they were too fat or... <laughs> Usually it's because they were too fat or I wasn't attracted to them, sad to say. But this girl who I worked with when I was a delivery driver for Pizza Hut, she showed me love. She really did love me. She would never admit it because as much as people say, oh, men have egos, women have egos too. And one part of that ego is not admitting that you love the person as much as you do. And she did. There was one time I came into, um, you know, when you finish your delivery run, you come in to get cashed out. And she would literally come from the back of the store to the front of the store just to cash me out. And I didn't even realize she was doing it until one of the managers pointed it out. And I, I, I appreciated that. I was so flattered. I'm like, oh, she's so cute. Okay, I had to point that out there because, like I said, when you're young and you're inexperienced, you don't recognize those things like that, you know? Like, you just don't understand it. Okay, so, when I was too young and inexperienced to recognize love for what it was, none of it had any, none of it had anything to do with the fact that I didn't love myself or I didn't know how to love myself. This is the hit. Well, how can you love someone if you don't know how to love yourself? Because, I mean, when you're a glutton, I mean, I... When I first came to Tampa, Florida at the age of 18, back in 2005, I was very selfish, all right? I loved myself. I self-indulged and I self-loved myself all the way up to 378 pounds. It's called gluttony, okay? So the, the notion that, oh, well, how can you love someone if you don't know how to love yourself first? That's, that's nonsense. And recently I had a lady tell me in one of the comments is that um, my working out to lose weight, that was a form of my loving myself. Even if that is the case, people are missing the point. I didn't work out and lose weight because I love myself. I did it because I love women. And I simply asked myself, what are the odds that I find someone who's attractive and in shape, which is the kind of women I, I was attracted to, you know, what are the odds that they, those single women will go for a big fat guy? I'm not biggie, I'm not big pun, I don't have money. I don't, I, what's his name, DJ Khaled. You know, I'm pretty sure girls, I mean, there's a lot of things, other external things that a lot of women are attracted to when it comes to those big fat men. All the things I didn't have because it doesn't make sense that I have it. Why would I walk around thinking I'm big biggie or big pun? I'm not rapper. I'm not extroverted. At that. So it doesn't make sense that I have those things. So I built myself. I worked on myself. I improved myself to make myself more appealing to women. You could say, oh, well, it's because you love yourself and you love yourself. It's nonsense. No, no, I did it for women. But Rock, you loved yourself enough to stop. Just stop, I know. You wanna lump everyone who's improving a life into the same category of self-love, just so you can keep promoting self-love and feeling good about this selfish behavior. Unless you're working with you for the purpose of benefiting others or to appeal to others, I don't wanna hear it, okay? Stay over there with your self-love crowd. I'm trying to avoid you as God commanded me. We love because he first loved us. We love because God loved us first, not because God loved himself first. I like this scripture at 1 John 4, 19 so much because it wasn't, I'm just sorry, this is gonna, gonna take it to the house for a little bit, but it wasn't until I read the Bible until I really, it wasn't until I read the Bible that I really began to understand what love truly is. Honestly, I know that sounds super cheesy, but there's so many examples of husbands and wives in the Bible that I can learn from. There's so many warnings and lessons taught by men far better than myself, far better than the people that you find on Twitter and Instagram. All right, we're talking about kings and, you know, philosophers, men who talk to God. And more importantly, God demonstrated his love for us, not just in giving us Jesus Christ who died for our sins, but there's been so many times where I was truly alone in this world when it comes to my peers. I do not fit in with most of my millennial peers. A lot of my millennial peers, they don't have the same mentality as me. I was born 1986. So a lot of, and I was born 1986 at a time where, you know, Michael Jordan was dunking on people, where people were getting post rise and their shots swatted into the racks. And we said the word gay to describe someone lame. You know, like we, it was just a different time, you know? Um, and I, I say all that because when you don't fit in with a lot of your peers, you think that something's wrong with you. There's nothing wrong with me. We're just different. Let me back it up. 
I was born in 1986, but I don't fit in with most of my peers. I don't have the same mindset. I don't have the same goals. I don't think I don't think like them. I'm very competitive. I feel like if you're gonna do something, you do the best at it. I don't just look at a paycheck as a paycheck, but if I'm tasked to do something, I, I find fulfillment in it. You know, if I don't find fulfillment in it, there's something wrong. Fuck, forget the paycheck. All right, like it, it's just purpose. I like to work. I like to feel important. That's that is my nature. Okay, and I don't think a lot of my peers have that same mentality. So I felt alone. You know, I'm not part of the Pride campaign. I'm not part of you know all. The, I'm not part of the Black Lives Matter. I'm black. I'm not part of that crew. I see white people as my brothers and sisters just as much as I see black people you know so I di I don't fit in with my my generation and because of that and I have to interact with them I have to work with them I feel alone despite surrounded by so many and during those moments God he didn't forsake me my strength my discipline my intelligence my endurance the defiance to never give in to this wicked society I give all credit and glory to God I say that as a young man because we have I don't want to condone anything I know we're about to talk about some very sensitive issues but more and more we keep talking about the angry young men in the world who are shooting up schools and events it and we're, we're talking about them as if they just fell out of the sky no that's not it okay i can tell you that as a young man i was very angry i was i felt unappreciated and unwanted in this world when i was 28 this is back in 2014 i started that was the year that i started reading the bible and when you read the bible and you start to commit yourself to being a christian that's when you shed off the old skin and you become a true christian and this was tough because we live in a satan dominated society so i had to say goodbye to a lot of friends who you know they kept pushing me like one of my, two of my friends, they were out in the parking lot. They were talking about, Rock, you need to go out and have sex. You know, you're getting older. It's going to be too late. They act like if I didn't have sex as soon as possible, one, women won't respect me. They won't appreciate me. And it's going to be too late because women, it, 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 was, it was so tough, man. That night, it was so much peer pressure. And I never told anyone this, but one night that year, back in 2014, I went into a dark, empty conference room. And I remember, like, the pressure with all of what I was trying to do with my life, I, I had just gotten over a breakup and then the girl that I dated, she was now seeing someone else and they flaunted right in front of me. And the same with another girl, all while my paramour, the Colombian who I write about, you know, she's there, you know, and I'm pushing myself to be a good author, to get one of my books published. I just finished that, I, you know, and when you finish a book like that consumed two years of your life, you know, you can't get it published right away. So it's like, you just crossed the finish line. You just created this, you just accomplished this major feat in your life and there's no applause. There's no spec, there's no spectators. There's no trophy. It's just step one, you know? So I know what it's like to run the marathon and not the sprint. However, it would feel great. It would be awesome if I had supporters, if I had encouragement along the way telling me, Rock, you're doing great. We're so proud of you. But because I didn't have any of that and I didn't fit in with my peers, I felt like I just didn't exist and when you don't this is why I when you feel like you don't exist it's very tempting to self-delete you know like I know my mom would miss me I know my brothers would miss me but to, it's sad to say that's not enough it didn't feel like enough you know I wanted to be loved by someone who didn't have a familial obligation to me and because I didn't have that and I didn't know what it, it felt like to have that because I was so dependent on human validation, on human love and human comfort. It was just tough. I really did get on my knees in a dark, empty conference room and I cried. You know, and instead of turning myself into a statistic that night, I poured my heart through prayer, you know, to my Heavenly Father. I told God everything, every single thing. And He knows, He already knows, you know, but sometimes you just need to confess it. You need to tell them. You know, you need to unburden yourself, as Jesus Christ puts it, you know, and I did it. I took a chance, you know, for all the atheists out there who don't believe in God and say, oh, you're just talking to some imaginary being in the sky. You know, I, I feel bad for you guys because I felt power that day, you know, like I can't put into words how sufficient, like how uh, I can't put into words how much my life changed after that night. You know, God, he didn't owe me anything. For years, I refused to pray or even reach out and touch the Bible. You know, I hated organized religions for so long due to the scars of my upbringing. You know, God had no reason, no, no, no obligation. I, you know, he didn't have a covenant with me. You know, he didn't owe me anything. He had no reason to take such pity on this selfish young man, but he did. 
He heard my words and he strengthened my heart. I mean, he really did. He really strengthened my heart. I cried, I dried my tears, I wiped my face, I got out and I went and finished my shift and I went home that night determined. Like my life is different. You know, I'm not gonna go down the same path. You know, and just, to, I'm going off on a little bit of a tangent here, but that human need for validation, that human need, it is a human need. You know, like in the book of, I think, um, one of the Thessalonians, it talks about when you, when it comes to the kingdom of heaven, you know, we're not going to have the same existence. You know, Jesus Christ said that when, when we die, we're not going to, and we're in the kingdom of heaven, we're not going to be given in marriage. Marriage, We're going to be like the angels of heaven. I think that us, our need for want and love and appreciation, all these are human conditions. And I'm not saying that's a bad thing. It is a good thing. But if you don't have that, if it's not abundant for you, then you do need to be strong. You do need to harden your heart. And that's what I did. God gave me the ability to do that, you know, where, and this is why, this is kind of, it's almost, I mean, this is why I read the Bible every night, you know, because every day I don't, I don't come home to someone who I can talk to and lean upon and give me strength and say, oh, wow, that's so awesome. I can't pour my heart out to people. So I read the Bible because I know God sees everything. He sees what I'm going through. He sees the temptation I face. He sees the resistance that I put up with, you know, that I, that I, he sees my resistance to this world, you know, and to me, that's rewarding. That's how I know what love is. It's because he gave me the strength to pick my head up and keep going. It's because he blessed me with this internal code and printed by his holy scriptures. The, the side effect of which is the defiance against Satan's wicked system of things, which in turn gives me a sense of satisfaction and is a reward in of itself. I know what love is because God embedded in me a strong conscience to strive to do the right thing regardless of whether it's appreciated, seen, or rewarded by other humans. The side effect of this is a reduced need for human validation. Don't get me wrong, compliments and appreciation are always uplifting to me, but simply doing the right thing. I know God sees me and he's proud. This means 10 times more to me than any human on earth. I know what love is because God assures us all that justice will prevail. And as long as we endure to the end, we have the hope of everlasting life and a paradise, a better world, one where there is no suffering, there is no cancer, no sickness, no pain, no death, one where we, we don't need to worry about our loved ones passing away. I'll leave you with this. At 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 4 through 7, the scriptures tell us, love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. I know what love is because Jesus Christ was blameless, perfect, and innocent. Yet he signed his name on the death warrant for all of us corrupt, guilty, and undeserving humans. He died so our sins can be forgiven. We have the hope of everlasting life because he died for us. He died so that we could live. Thanks for listening.